Hello, I'm Rich Musler, author, Bible teacher, and pastor of a very small church in Louisville, Texas. Thank you for studying God's Word with me today. We've been investigating wisdom, and specifically the wisdom God instilled in one man, a man named Solomon. We are interested in how he got it, how he used it, and how it benefited him. I hope that studying it in this way will give you a desire to attain wisdom from God. There are seven principles of wisdom found in God's Word. In previous lessons, we discussed the first two, so let's review them. The first is this. Wisdom is God's gift to His children for use in the here and now. Wisdom is a moment-by-moment -moment opportunity to live life in accord with God's plan for your life. It is for the present, your here and now. The second wisdom principle is this. Wisdom is freely given to those who request it from God and diligently seek it. Solomon, the son of David, was king of Israel. He asked God to give him wisdom and sought wisdom in all of his undertakings. He understood that he desperately needed wisdom to effectively lead the children of God, and he wanted to make certain that his decisions as their ruler aligned with God's will. And that brings us to the third principle of wisdom. Wisdom aligns your will with the will of Almighty God. No truly wise decision can ever be contrary to God's will. Behaving wisely means that you are acting in accord with God's will for your life. Solomon's will aligned with God's will. He understood what God wanted him to do, and so he set out to do it. According to the Bible, he was the wisest man in history, with the exception of the Son of God, of course. Solomon was therefore also the wisest politician in history. Can you imagine the pressure on young Solomon growing up as the child of King David? How would you like to be the child of some world-acclaimed celebrity? Can you imagine the pressure on, say, Billy Graham's children? Or how would you like to be the son of George Washington or the daughter of Barbara Streisand? How could anything you achieve in life exceed or even match the fame and accomplishments of such a famous parent. Think of the attention given to the children of U.S. presidents or the Queen of England. The spotlight is always on them. It is as though the world expects something great to come of the children of famous people. It must be challenging growing up in that sort of environment. Well, Solomon's father was King David. King David. Imagine growing up with... Uh, everyone expecting you to exceed his accomplishments. Just imagine what it must have been like for Solomon following in the footsteps of his father, the man who killed the giant Goliath and became a national hero while yet a teenager, who became a valiant warrior and hero of his nation, who married a princess who was anointed king at the hands of Samuel, the prophet's prophet. And on top of all that, who wrote most of the psalms they sang in church each Sabbath day. What could young Solomon possibly do to top those accomplishments? Studies have been done of children of famous people. Most never match the success, fame, and esteem their famous parent did. But Solomon did. Why? Well, because Solomon asked God for wisdom. Solomon understood that wisdom would enable him to effectively rule God's people. But how did he know that? Who told Solomon about the value of wisdom? As it is with all children of famous celebrities, the potential for Solomon to rebel under the constant pressure of being King David's son must have been great. Instead, Solomon had a wonderful relationship with his father. He even wrote about it in the Proverbs. When I was a son with my father, tender and precious to my mother, he taught me and said, Your heart must hold on to my words. Keep my commands and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Don't forget or turn away from the words of my mouth. Don't abandon wisdom and she will watch over you. Love her and she will guard you. Wisdom is supreme. So get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get understanding cherish her, and she will exalt you. If you embrace her, she will honor you. She will place a garland of grace on your head. She will give you a crown of beauty. So it was King David who advised his son Solomon to get wise. 
And did Solomon heed his father's advice? You bet he did. He made a decision somewhere along the line, a commitment actually, to acquire wisdom. He wrote about that too. I resolved that I will be wise, but it was beyond me. What exists is beyond reach and very deep. Who can discover it? I turned my thoughts to know, explore, and seek wisdom and an explanation for things, and to know that wickedness is stupidity and folly is madness. And so Solomon diligently sought wisdom from God. So too must we, if we wish to acquire wisdom from God. Turn your thoughts to know, explore, and to seek wisdom from God. What were the results of Solomon's search for wisdom? Well, the scriptures tell us. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind, like the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all other people, more than Ethan the Ezraite, Heman, Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal and his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. He also told 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. People came from all the nations to hear the wisdom of Solomon, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Have you ever even heard of Ethan the Ezraite, or Heman, or Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal? Well, me either. And yet apparently they were once men renowned for their wisdom, Today their names are forgotten, but no one has forgotten the name of Solomon. Now think a moment of those occupying the highest leadership positions of our nation today. Are they seeking wisdom from God as they enact new legislation? My guess is that in a few centuries, many of their names will be forgotten too. Certainly the godless will not be remembered in heaven. Only those who serve the Lord will hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. When we make wise choices, we are also making godly choices. When we make godly choices, we are serving the Lord. Wisdom is the process of conforming your will to God's will. That's why sin is never wise, because... Sin is doing that which is contrary to the will of God. Not many of us are asked to rule a mighty nation. Regardless, in whatever role you serve in this life, whatever job you hold right now, whatever accountability you have at this moment in your life, making wise choices assures that you are aligning your will with God's in the performance of your duties. And because you make wise choices, you cannot help but be successful in God's sight. You see, when your will is aligned with God's will, as you do the things he asks you to do, when he asks you to do them, he blesses your efforts. Wisdom leads to success in life. Practicing wisdom, you begin to experience what the scriptures call an abundant life, one full of blessings from the Lord. Why? Because you are living life as God intended it. And that is the fourth wisdom principle. Wisdom gives life. Abundant life is the fundamental reward for attaining wisdom. For some, an abundant life may mean the accumulation of much wealth and power. For others, the abundant life means other blessings. God's blessings are unique to each of us. The simple truth is, as you attain wisdom, God blesses you in extraordinary ways. And as you are blessed, those around you, those who depend upon you, your family and friends, your employer, your constituents, they are also blessed through your wisdom. Solomon was blessed because he sought and deployed wisdom. The people he ruled, those who depended upon his leadership, were also blessed. Under Solomon's rule, the nation of Israel experienced its greatest sustained period of prosperity and security in history. I'm reading today from the Holman Christian Standard translation of the Bible. Solomon accumulated 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, which he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. The king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones 
and he made cedar as abundant as sycamore in the Judean foothills. Solomon's horses came from Egypt and Kew. The king's straighters would get them from Kew at the going price. A chariot would be imported from Egypt for 15 pounds of silver and a horse for about 4 pounds of silver. In the same way, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and to the kings of Aaron through their agents. So, if you do the math, a chariot, the equivalent of a modern-day armored vehicle, and two horses to pull it cost 23 pounds of silver. In today's dollars, at $25 an ounce, that translates to $400 per pound, or $9,200 per horse-drawn chariot. 1,400 of them would be almost $13 million. The 12,000 horses for the horsemen would cost another $19 million. So just to equip his army with state-of-the-art equipment and enable them to move swiftly into battle, Solomon invested $32 million in modern terms. Of course, that was just the beginning. Solomon then had to feed and house that vast military of his. But even all that is nothing in comparison to the expenditure King Solomon would invest preparing to construct God's temple. Remember, the temple was designed by his father David under the influence of the Holy Spirit, but the job of building it fell upon young King Solomon. Then Solomon sent word to King Hiram of Tyre, Do for me what you did for my father David. You sent him cedars to build him a house to live in. Now I am building a temple for the name of Yahweh my God in order to dedicate it to him for burning fragrant incense before him, for displaying the rose of the bread of the presence continually, and for sacrificing burnt offerings for the morning and the evening, the Sabbaths and the new moons, and the appointed festivals of the Lord our God. This is ordained for Israel forever. The temple that I am building will be great, for our God is greater than any of the gods. But who is able to build a temple for him, since even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain him? Who am I then that I should build a temple for him, except as a place to burn incense before him? Therefore send me a craftsman who is skilled in engraving, to work with gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and with purple, crimson, and blue yarn. He will work with the craftsmen who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, appointed by my father David. Also send me cedar, cypress, and algum logs from Lebanon, for I know that your servants know how to cut the trees of Lebanon. Note that my servants will be with your servants to prepare logs for me in abundance, because the temple I am building will be great and wonderful. I will give your servants, the woodcutters who cut the trees, 100,000 bushels of wheat flour, 100,000 bushels of barley, 110,000 gallons of wine, and 110,000 gallons of oil. Now, I'm no expert in translating these expenditures into modern-day dollars, but you don't have to be an accountant to understand that Solomon was sparing no expense. Solomon took a census of all the foreign men in the land of Israel after the census that his father David had conducted, and the total was 153,600. Solomon made 70,000 of them porters, 80,000 stonecutters in the mountains, and 3,600 supervisors to make the people work. God blessed Solomon and the people of Israel with abundance. Because they chose to honor God with their focused effort to build a magnificent temple, Nowhere in Scripture do you find that the cost of building it was a financial burden on the Israelites. Also, during this period in Israel's history, there is no record of any plagues or pandemics or wars or of terrorist activity at all. God hadn't even yet spoken this truth, but the people of Israel seemed to understand it intuitively. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Would that the people of our nation, the citizens of the United States of America, understand this promise from God. Not even all Christians grasp the power behind this promise. 
Many promises of God are unconditional, but not this one. With this promise, there is a condition. There is a but. If my people humble themselves, but. But if you turn away and abandon my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot you from my land, which I have given you, and this house, which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. And I will make it a proverb and an object of scorn among all peoples. My friends, this is the reality of America today. As a nation, we have abandoned God's statutes and commandments. As a nation, we overlook the blatant sin tolerated in our society. As a nation, many of our leaders sneer at the Bible. Well, perhaps sneer is too harsh a word. But effectively, the end result of the attitude expressed by many of our leaders is the same as though they were sneering at God's holy word. For example, the Bible clearly declares that God created us in his likeness. Male and female created he them. Even so, our politicians have legalized and enabled what is termed gender transition, that is, allowing someone born of one sex to transition surgically and with the use of certain drugs to the opposite sex. This has had unintended consequences. Now, when legislatures pass laws restricting those boys who choose, despite their possessing X and Y chromosomes, to become girls, when laws are passed restricting them from competing in school athletics against those who truly are girls, such laws are ridiculed, challenged, and probably, in the climate that exists in our nation today, such laws probably will be overturned by the Supreme Court of the land. In the name of equal rights for all, we've created unequal competitive sports advantages for boys who pretend to be girls. Until our church leaders make the wise choice to take a stand against the decadence that exists in this nation, until we hear from our pulpits what the Bible has to say concerning issues such as transgenderism and abortion and pornography and sex outside the bond of marriage, which has become the norm in America today, until we hear the truth spoken by our pastors and preachers and priests, America will be blessed less by God. Politicians say God bless America often. But then they pass legislation that causes Americans to be blessed less. Going forward, we may experience additional plagues and financial crises. As long as our pulpits remain silent and refuse to call sin a sin and not whitewash, downplay, cover up, or even worse, ignore these issues, God will not heal our nation. Instead, one day, he may uproot us from the very land that he has given us. Why? Because we are a nation whose leaders make unwise choices. What our nation must have right now, today, are righteous Christian men and women who take their duties as salt of the earth seriously. We need them serving first in our pulpits and second in our legislatures they must be men and women who don't just say they believe in God, but act like it. Men and women who boldly let the world see their faith in the wise choices they make and in the actions that they take. Yes, we need both godly ministers in our churches and godly politicians in our legislatures. We need them now because presently, frankly, there are just aren't enough of them. It was Solomon's father, King David, who wrote this. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. Even the worst simpletons in our Congress and in our pulpits may become wise if they would understand this basic truth. God's instruction is perfect. It revives the lives of those who obey it. His testimony is trustworthy, always. Solomon understood this. Then Solomon began to build the Lord's temple in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. 
at the site David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. He began to build on the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. Now, why did it take Solomon more than four years to begin construction of the temple after becoming king? Was he slacking off? (laughs) No, it took Solomon four years just to assemble all the equipment, the cedar and the gold and the silver and all those gemstones that would be used. It took Solomon four years to get all the foreign workmen in place and his people organized so that construction could begin. Solomon was building a permanent temple, one that would last through the ages, though at times later it was destroyed and rebuilt. It was meant to replace the temporary tabernacle that had accompanied Israel as they wandered in the desert. Mount Moriah was the place where the founder of their faith, Abraham, was prevented by God from sacrificing his son, Isaac. This was holy ground, which David had bought when it was being used as a threshing floor, separating grain from chaff. Now listen, God gives to his faithful followers assignments, as he did Solomon. You will be equipped to accomplish the mission he assigns you. I doubt it will be building a temple, but even so it may take you years to prepare. God's timing is perfect. There's no need to rush. It is far better for you to wait upon God and do it right than to get ahead of God and do it poorly. These are Solomon's foundations for building God's temple. The length was 90 feet and the width 30 feet. The portico, which was across the front extending across the width of the temple, was 30 feet wide. Its height was 30 feet. He overlaid its inner surface with pure gold, The larger room he paddled with cypress wood, overlaid with fine gold, and decorated with palm trees and chains. He adorned the temple with precious stones for beauty, and the gold was the gold of Parvaim. He overlaid the temple, the beams, the threshold, its walls and doors with gold, and he carved cherubim on the walls. Those were the basic dimensions of the temple Solomon was assigned to build. It was ornate overlaid with gold and decorated with palm trees and cherubim. But there's more. Then he made the most holy place. Its length corresponded to the width of the temple, 30 feet, and its width was 30 feet. He overlaid it with 45,000 pounds of fine gold. The weight of the nails was 20 ounces of gold, and he overlaid the ceiling with gold. He made two cherubim of sculptured work, for the most holy place, and he overlaid them with gold. The overall length of the wings of the cherubim was 30 feet. The wing of one was seven and a half feet, touching the wall of the room. Its other wing was seven and a half feet, touching the wing of the other cherub. The wing of the other cherub was seven and a half feet, touching the wall of the room, and its other wing was seven and a half feet, reaching the wing of the other cherub. The wingspan of these cherubim was 30 feet. They stood on their feet and faced the larger room. He made the veil of blue, purple, and crimson yarn and fine linen, and he wove cherubim into it. In front of the temple, he made two pillars, each 27 feet high. The capital on top of each was seven and a half feet high. He had made chain work in the inner sanctuary and also put it on top of the pillars. He made 100 pomegranates and fastened them to the chain work. Then he set up the pillars in front of the sanctuary, one on the right and one on the left. He named the one on the right Jachin and the one on the left Boaz. I think it's rather charming that Solomon named the two pillars upholding the structure Jachin and Boaz. Jachin, whose name means he will establish in ancient Hebrew, was one who survived the exile in Babylon and returned to Israel as head of the 21st cadre of priests. And Boaz, you probably recognize, is the name of the faithful man who married Ruth, as directed by God's law. The Bible declares that he was a man who feared the Lord and kept his obligations among men. So Solomon named the two main pillars supporting the innermost sanctuary after godly and faithful men who feared the Lord. And what do we remember about the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And there it is again, 
wisdom. The twin pillars of wisdom are godliness and faithfulness. In a project so vast as building a temple, wisdom is essential. But one might ask, was it wise to decorate the temple so ornately? Was it necessary that it be lined with 45,000 pounds of gold? Does God truly need such a magnificent place in which to be worshipped? Well, the truth is, no human can build a home worthy of God. As magnificent as we can make it, he's worthy of far more. Solomon determined that the temple God had assigned him to construct would be the best that humans could design and build. He spared no expense, and God provided the provisions and the skilled labor he needed to do the job. Of course, a simple chapel is an adequate place for believers to gather and pray and meet God. But it is never wrong to make a house of worship beautiful, as beautiful as you can make it, so long as it honors the Lord and brings glory to his name. Fact is, our God is spirit. He's to be worshipped in spirit and truth. The purpose of a temple is not to house the God of heaven, but to be a gathering place where the faithful may worship the God in heaven. One day, we believers will see something much more fabulous than any temple constructed by human hands. We will watch in awe as the new Jerusalem descends from heaven. Its radiance will be like a very precious stone, like a jasper stone, and bright as crystal. And there in that city, Christ Jesus will take his throne as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the New Jerusalem, you'll walk a street paved with gold so fine that it appears transparent. The foundations of the city walls will be adorned with every kind of precious stone. The New Jerusalem will be the most incredible, amazing, beautiful, and dazzling city ever constructed, unlike anything we've seen before. Our God's dwelling will be with humanity, and he will live with us from that point onward. We will be his people, and God himself will be with us and will be our God. He will wipe away every tear. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because, as the Bible declares, the previous things have passed away. That's the future we have in store for us, you and I. But for now, to help us handle the challenges we face in this lifetime, God has given us a tool, meant to be used in the here and now, called wisdom. I'm Rich Musler. Thank you for studying God's Word with me today. Your assignment this week is to ask God for wisdom, then diligently search for it. Wisdom is all around you. And when you make decisions, small ones or big ones, focus on making wise choices. That is, decisions that honor God. As you do, you will discover that your will is being aligned more and more with the will of God. And that is wisdom. See you next week.